mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest one of all? Thou, O Queen, art the fairest in the land. I'm sure you've heard the story of Snow White. Would you like to possess a magical mirror? A mirror holds the power to unveil the mysteries of the universe. With this mirror, you could gain insight into any corner of the globe, talk with anyone, and perceive the world from multiple perspectives. Sounds astonishing, doesn't it? However, here's the twist. You might not realize it, but you already hold such a magical tool in your grasp. It's right there in your pocket or on your desk, your mobile phone or your computer. These modern-day marvels enable you to access vast knowledge and connect with anyone, anywhere, at any time. Marvel at the magic of technology that's already within your reach. The potential of these devices comes from their ability to connect with others all around the world. This vast network of connected devices is what we call the Internet. Even though you use the Internet countless times in your daily routine, do you really understand how it works? Watch until the end of this video to become one of the few people who truly grasp the magic behind this marvelous discovery of humankind. How the Internet Works In modern days, when we need to know something, we just have to ask the question from the Internet. It gives us an enormous amount of information about our query. Where does it come from? This information is stored in special computer systems that are connected together. We call this as servers because those serve us the necessary information. There are more than 100 million servers connected to the Internet. Every web page we see through our browser is stored on some server connected to the Internet, such as Facebook, YouTube, Gmail, TikTok, and many more. To get information from these servers, we have to connect to this network using our devices. Since we are getting services from the server, our devices are called clients. A client is any computer hardware or software device that requests access to a service provided by a server. How can a client like us gain access to the Internet? Even though there are servers out there, we can't request information from them on our own. To do that, we have to contact an Internet Service Provider Company, or ISP, and request an Internet connection. For their services, customers have to pay the Internet Service Provider a nominal fee, which varies according to the amount of data they use or the data plan they purchase. Then, we can access the Internet through the ISP. This is the basic structure of the Internet. Clients request the information from the Internet through the ISP, and servers serve these requests. For instance, consider a scenario where Client A wishes to access YouTube from a computer. In this case, it sends a request to the YouTube server through its Internet service provider. Subsequently, the server delivers the requested information back to the client. Now, how does a client know which server it should access to get the information, and how does the server identify which client to serve? For instance, consider our postal services. Despite there being billions of people and households worldwide, we can still send a letter or a parcel to a precise recipient. This is enabled by the use of an address. Each home has a unique address to ensure accurate delivery. Similarly, to identify each device connected to the Internet, we use a specific kind of address, known as the Internet Protocol, IP, address. It is typically expressed in four sets of numbers separated by periods. Each number in the set falls within the range of 0 to 255. These IP addresses are assigned by the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. Now, each client connected to the Internet can request information from a specific server using its IP address, and likewise, servers can easily send information to specific clients using their IP addresses. But there is still a problem. How many websites do you access daily? YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Google, Instagram, 
and many more. Hundreds, maybe thousands. But do you know the IP address of any of those? None of us can remember them all. IP addresses are a set of numbers. That's perfectly fine for computers, but we human beings have a hard time remembering that type of address. To simplify things, we can associate an IP address with a human-readable name, known as a domain name. A domain name serves as the user-friendly version of an IP address. Let's consider an example of how we load the information stored in the YouTube server using the domain name. At the outset, we make a request to access a particular server, usually accomplished by clicking on a link on a web page or typing out a domain. The first step in accessing a website is translating the domain into the corresponding IP address. So, how do we transition from a domain to an IP address? Initially, your computer checks with your ISP, which keeps a list of frequently requested websites. If someone has recently requested the same website, the ISP can promptly provide the IP address. If the ISP doesn't possess the IP address, it forwards your request to the nearest domain name system server, DNS server, a specialized type of server. A DNS server retains a mapping of all domains to IP addresses. It locates the correct IP address and transmits it back to you through the ISP. Once your computer acquires the IP address, it sends a request for specific information to that IP address. Upon receiving our request, the server at the designated IP address sends back the data we requested to our IP address. This is the fundamental mechanism of the Internet. We make a request to access a particular server using the domain name. ISP or DNS server locates the correct IP address and transmits it back to you. Our computer sends a request for specific information to that IP address. The server at the designated IP address sends back the data we requested to our IP address. Now let's dive further deep. There are currently more devices connected to the Internet than there are people in the world. It is estimated that there will be 30.9 billion devices connected to the Internet worldwide in 2023. How do these numerous devices work seamlessly with each other? The secret lies in protocols. By definition, a protocol is a system of rules that outlines the correct conduct and procedures to be followed. For example, consider our postal service. Imagine you need to send a letter to your friend. You can't simply write the message on a piece of paper, put it in the mailbox, and expect it to be delivered. Specific protocols must be adhered to. Firstly, you must place the letter inside an envelope. Then, you need to accurately write the recipient's name and address on the right side of the envelope. Finally, affix a stamp to the envelope. Following these protocols ensures that the communication happens correctly. Similarly, on the Internet, we employ a common protocol system to govern how data is transmitted across the network. Whether you're sending an email, browsing a website, or streaming a video, your device communicates with servers and devices worldwide using these protocols. There are many protocols make the Internet possible. Some common examples of protocols include TCP IP. This is the most common Internet protocol suite. It includes protocols for routing, addressing, and transporting data over the Internet. TCP IP is used by all devices that connect to the Internet, including computers, smartphones, tablets, and routers. HTTP. This is the protocol that is used to transfer web pages between web servers and web browsers. When you type a URL into a web browser, HTTP is used to fetch the web page from the web server and display it in your browser. FTP. This protocol is used to transfer files between computers. FTP is a common protocol for transferring large files, such as software updates and video files. SMTP. This protocol is used to send email. 
SMTP is used by email clients to send email messages to email servers. POP3. This protocol is used to receive email. POP3 is used by email clients to download email messages from email servers. IMAP. This protocol is used to access email from a remote server. IMAP is used by email clients to access email messages that are stored on an email server. With IMAP, you can access your email from any device that has an internet connection. Protocols are standardized so that devices from different manufacturers can communicate with each other. This makes it possible to build large, interconnected networks. Let's delve into the TCP-I protocol. The TCP IP model serves as the default method for data communication on the Internet. It was developed to facilitate the accurate and correct transmission of data between devices. Let's consider a scenario where we need to send an image to our friend across the world through the Internet. TCP breaks our messages into pieces to avoid the necessity of resending the entire message if issues arise during transmission. These individual pieces are referred to as packets. Each packet may take a different route between the source and destination computer, depending on whether the original route becomes congested or unavailable. Once the packets reach their destination, they are automatically reassembled, ensuring that the complete message, in this case, the image, is reconstructed correctly. That covers the basics of how the Internet works. But wait, the Internet stands as one of the most influential discoveries in human history, shaping every aspect of our world and encompassing nearly all knowledge discovered by humankind. It is a collective resource belonging to us all. However, access to the Internet remains unequal, with a significant portion of the population still lacking reliable and affordable connectivity. This digital divide carries far-reaching consequences, limiting opportunities for individuals and communities to thrive in the digital age. Nevertheless, this access remains unequal, with a substantial portion of the population lacking reliable and affordable connectivity. In some countries, governments censor and control the Internet, while in others, corporations dictate who has access to specific content and services. This digital divide has profound consequences, restricting opportunities for individuals and communities to thrive in the digital age. The provision of free Internet access should be acknowledged as a human right, as individuals unable to access online resources, particularly in developing countries, lack meaningful ways to influence the global forces shaping their everyday lives. As political engagement increasingly occurs online, basic freedoms such as free expression, freedom of information, and freedom of assembly are undermined if some citizens have Internet access while others do not. Free access to the Internet is not merely a luxury. It is a fundamental right that should be accessible to everyone. By addressing barriers to connectivity and implementing strategies to expand free Internet access, we can ensure that all individuals have the opportunity to participate in the digital world, enjoy its benefits, and contribute to a more equitable and inclusive society. That's all for today. If you think my contents are valuable to the world, you are welcome to join my Patreon community. Like and subscribe to Professor Mad for more interesting videos.